Heavenly Father, I thank you uh, very much that you have allowed me to have the time to do this recording, to do this translation of another set of sermon notes. I require really your your help for this now, and I just plead with you, and I do ask you to to bless, to help, to give strength, to give the right words, to convey what um, what really is um, what what would your intention really is with with the text oh, this sermon will talk about, this translation will talk about the text in your in your word in the Bible. Father, the, the book about which this sermon is so rich. It is so rich that it is almost, um, yeah, it is almost uh, a little bit obnoxious to even try and um, try and put together what, what it is about in just one sermon and in one translation. Lord, I'm aware of that, but I think it is so important that it is said and that it is proclaimed and I just ask you to bless it. Again, I know there's no strength in me, no, no accomplishing, no completing, no succeeding without, without your help. And so I ask you, Lord, that you would be in this now <clears throat> and bless what is said. Uh, please also bless uh, those who may listen to this and may hear it and may, may I, just, I just really hope they would be and pray that they would be edified by it and they would see you more clearly and recognize you as the paramount important thing in their lives and in the life of everyone in history and in the whole bible please lord i need you in this in jesus name amen <clears throat> so this sermon is translated from notes that um, were actually written when the sermon was originally delivered in German. Uh, this sermon has uh, was delivered in November 2018, and uh, it's actually an introduction to the Epistle to the Colossians. Um, I will try and cut it down a little bit, although it's, it's very difficult for me to, to do so. Um, I'll give a, a, a really, really short introduction about Colossae, what, uh, about the city, about the historical background, but I won't uh, stay there very long. I really want to go into the text, and so just bear with me. Um, after going <clears throat> through some verses in the Epistle of Colossians, after just showing what this whole uh, epistle is about, really, I would like to make a couple of statements about this, about this topic, about the whole question of how Christocentric is the scripture. And so I, I just am going to try this and see how the Lord will, will be with me on this. Well, <clears throat> historically, uh, back then when the letter was written to Colossi, um, Colossi was, was, a, was a city, it was a thriving city. It was close to a main uh, traffic route that was going through uh, through uh, Asia Minor. I, I suppose you could say this is kind of today, uh, like it's Turkey today. And it was actually at a, at a road that was going essentially from the west all the way through to the east of, Tur of today's Turkey, of modern Turkey. And it started in Ephesus and uh, it just went on going east, 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 and then sort of in, well, roughly in the middle of, of modern Turkey, that's where Colossae uh, was located. And uh, the city had been around quite a while. It had been around for almost 500 years um, before this letter was written by Paul to the Colossians. It was an established city, some historians write, in the, in the, in the area of Phrygia, which is geographically namely modern Turkey. And there were actually two more cities close to Colossae. It was Laodicea in the west and Hierapolis in the north. Uh, those are both names of cities that are uh, pretty well known in, uh, in ancient history. 
and even in the Bible, and Laodicea is apparently known from Revelation and from other epistles where it is mentioned. Both cities um, actually kind of uh, passed Colossae in its in its economic uh, importance later because uh, the Romans kind of changed the traffic route, and so Colossae was not really right there at the main highway anymore um, because of the Romans rerouting this whole thing. So the other two cities, Laodicea and Hierapolis, became more important uh, in, a, in a secular uh, understanding. Well, uh, historically, it is also uh, noted, or I suppose you could say it is known, that all three cities, Colossae, um, Hierapolis, and Laodicea, later, uh, probably then after this letter was written, were destroyed, essentially completely destroyed, by a very, very heavy earthquake around the year 60 or 61 AD. And it was a horrible destruction, and that has been recorded uh, by historians. And uh, yeah, and all, all three church, uh, all three cities held uh, churches the way it looks. Uh, you can kind of guess that because at the end of Colossians in chapter four, uh, Paul uh, urges the Colossians to have this letter read also in those two other cities. Anyway, and so because there was this major earthquake in the year 60 or 61 AD, most people assume that the letter was written right before that happened, or a very few years before that. Uh, it also must have been sort of around that, that time, because uh, you can also tell from the letter, from the epistle, that Paul wrote this while he was in prison in Rome, presumably. Um, people were with him, you can tell from, from other epistles, and uh, not, not from other epistles, but you can tell from Colossians uh, chapter 4, verse 18. I'm, I'm not going to read it right now, but you can tell that Timothy was with him, Luke was with him, Onesimus was with him, Epaphras was with him, Aristarchus were with him. So he had a lot of visitors, and some of them may have been imprisoned with him, actually. Um, anyway, so Paul was, was in prison uh, very much, uh, very, very certainly because of the gospel, because of the proclamation of the gospel. And uh, yeah, so this is this is the kind of the, the situation out of which Paul writes this this epistle to the Colossians. So the first question is where uh, what's what's like the the provenance what provenance what is the what is the reason why was this letter written? Obviously, God inspired it. He wanted it to be part of the scriptures. Um, but uh, where did the Colossians stand spiritually? This is the first important questions uh, question to to think about. Uh, it, the the church in Colossae uh, was kind of a mix of um, Gentile Christians, uh, Jew Jewish Christians, and all kinds of other ethnicities um, that kind of formed the church there. Uh, so this is pretty likely um, for a, a couple of reasons that I'm not going to uh, detail here further. Um, the Colossians had learned... Uh, about Jesus Christ, about the gospel from a believer named Epaphras. And you can tell that from Colossians chapter 1, verse 7. Uh, there Epaphras is, has mentioned and that he is actually the one from whom they have learned and have followed then uh, the gospel. Um, and Epaphras was, as I mentioned before, with Paul when he wrote that letter to the Colossians. That you can actually learn from the epistle Philemon, uh, titled Philemon, where it says, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you. So, yeah. Well, so where did the Colossians stand spiritually? The teaching and the understanding of the church, uh, at least in the beginning, must have been pretty, pretty good, pretty healthy, uh, pretty solid. On a really, They really had started out really well. Uh, Paul actually says in Colossians 1, verse 6, um, that they had... Uh, heard the gospel and they had understood the grace of God in truth. Now, that is a pretty significant statement that Paul makes. So he uh, uh, gives it to them that they had really understood, at least in the beginning, uh, <coughs> the basic importance of the grace of God that he provides in Jesus Christ. So basically everything looked uh, pretty, pretty good. But Paul, of course, did not write this letter to the Colossians just to, to praise them. <laughs> he usually doesn't do that a whole lot. 
and uh, yeah, along the the letter, there's a lot of um, exhortations. Uh, there's this correction. There there are circumstances that that Paul addresses through God's work in this in this letter. He doesn't really um, criticize them that much, actually, at least not for any one particular false teaching or for a particular heresy, as he did, for instance, in Galatians, uh, and he does with all kinds of things in Corinthians and in other epistles. But he doesn't do that in Colossians. Um, even if he goes into some kinds of teachings, he never really goes really deep. Uh, there's all kinds of things in the epistle of Colossians, um, but there's really no compact, you know, there, there's no clear, clear line that you can draw around one particular issue that, that Paul tries to take down here. Um, it's a mix of all kinds of behaviors and, and misunderstandings, wrong, wrong imaginations about the faith, about, about how to really live in Christ with Christ, um, and those different things do not seem to to be very much connected with each other uh, to each other uh, and so some and even some theologians um, and you can tell when you read the literature about colossians no one really <laughs> seems to know what the uh, what the real problem in colossi really was um, I remember when I went to my I mean sort of seminary classes uh, the master's degree um, the 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 uh, something I had to answer in a paper uh, was was something about what what was the Colossian heresy, and so we had to read in a book um, what the Colossian heresy was and what what it is estimated um, that that it was. What was the problem really? So even authors and theologians really don't uh, many really don't really know what was the one thing, what the one problem that the Colossians had, and. Uh, Interesting enough, the, the epistle paints a very clear picture of what the problem is. Um, and we're going to try and chisel that out in the next few uh, minutes of this recording. So instead of uh, arguing against a particular wrong teaching in this epistle, Paul is not really doing that. Instead of doing that, he is um, presenting all the greatness and the wonders and the wonderfulness and the glory of Jesus Christ. So instead of uh, going along a negative route, he is going along a positive route. So he's stating the positive and he's exhorting or correcting through, through showing all kinds of things about Jesus Christ. And he does that. And, and that is really the principle that, that Paul uses along the whole, the whole epistle, the whole, along the whole letter. Uh, that in itself is already uh, a marvelous uh, piece of God's work here. Well, how does Paul do that? Well, first of all, he explains to the readers in glowing colors the, the glory of the person of Jesus Christ, who he is, how important he is. And he does that already in the first chapter. He build, He's building it up. Um, uh, and I, I will read Colossians 1, verse 14, and I will read all the way through verse 20. Coming from Jesus Christ, Paul says, in whom, which is Jesus Christ, in him, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He, Jesus Christ, is what he means, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, for Jesus Christ. And he is before all things. Uh, the, the, the grammar in there is obviously wonderful. He is, I am, he's God. And in him all things hold together. That is fantastic, simply fantastic. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to recognize, uh, reconcile 
to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. This is such a compact, uh, such a package of praise, a concentrate of praise and of, of presenting Christ's merit and glory and importance. Uh, that is magnificent. It is wonderful. And that is, uh, I think this is almost unmatched um, in any other part of the Bible. And then Paul uh, builds this up and then he even adds something in the next couple of verses, Colossians 1, 21 and 22. He says, and this guy, this Jesus Christ, that I just told you so many glorious things about, he actually has accomplished salvation for you. And he has reconciled you guys, you readers, with God. I read Colossians 1, 21 and 22. And you, you readers who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, another merit, another thing he did for them, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. So this is, this is, so the readers are, are really picked up and he is taking them into his into into his praise and they're they are uh, aligned with his uh, very very strong christocentric view <laughs> if you will of jesus christ and of of course the whole scripture and that is the word of god here it's not just paul's opinion so very important and paul even adds in colossians 1 24 and 25 he adds that for this hope, he is even willing to suffer voluntarily for them. He says in Colossians 1, 24 and 25, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. He's happy for their faith. And in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. So now he has painted a wonderful picture of, of who Christ is, the importance and all those things. And the second part of that is he is now exhorting them uh, to do something that many people don't think it really is doing. Uh, and, and that means they are exhorted to understand and to continue to grow in understanding. They should stay in their on their track to grow in the to grow in more and more in their to deepen their understanding of Jesus Christ and of the gospel grow in this understand it more and more to become wise to become more and more like Christ to be transformed into the likeness of him and 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 Paul wants to uh he wants to foster he wants to support and and uh, and benefit this understanding this is what paul works for and he says that in colossians 1 28 this is exactly what paul wants this is what paul is all about in the things he writes him jesus christ him we proclaim warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in christ that is that is as a very very strong statement and, and, and in order to do this, he always testifies to the source, the source of this understanding, the source of this maturity. And that is, of course, Jesus Christ. And he always needs to be in all things. Colossians 2, verses 1 through 4. Re I mean, read this. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those in Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face that their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love and now for what to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and of the knowledge of god's mystery which is christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge 
I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. So the focus on Christ, the focus on understanding, growing in it, being certain that you have the right understanding, that you're growing, you're on the right track. This is something that 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 Paul labors for. He goes through suffering, afflictions, so that he has opportunity and, and stays on it and with it. Yeah, the, this understanding. And, and look at the wisdom. All the wisdom is hidden in Christ. <laughs> and Christ is so preeminent here. It is uh, very, very clear. It's a strong emphasis that Paul puts here. The third point that Paul does is he says, because this source of understanding Christ is so important, they were supposed to not be distracted from Christ in their faith life. This should be and stay the focus. And he exhorts them. He, he tells them, you, should, you take care that that won't happen. Make sure you don't get distracted from this focus. And, and of course, he describes in chapter 2 what distractions uh, the Colossians faced. I'll read Colossians 2 verse 8, for example. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition. So things had gotten in the way and taken the seat of Christ in their faith life. The center, the focus in what they were looking for in the Bible, in their faith, in their all day lives. According to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. Again, Christ. It's Christ at the end. <laughs> Don't go away from the focus on Christ. It's, it's very clear. Then Colossians 2, verse 16. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink and with regard to a festival or new moon or Sabbath. These are sh a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So obviously there were there had been people who gave the, those Christians, those believers, a hard time about some traditional holidays or things about you know, the, certain diets, things you're supposed to eat, not to eat. Uh, some religious activities, some you know, the Sabbath or maybe some Jewish influences here. Um, so, and those were problems. And Paul says, no, not good. Don't, <laughs> the, you're so concerned about keeping up with these things or, or thinking about, should I, should I not do this? Did you have no time for Christ anymore? You're getting, you're getting yanked and, and pulled away from the real important thing. And then Colossians 2 verse 21. If someone tells you, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. So all those things that people um, uh, threw at the believers, maybe even within the church, and that got really distracting. What can we do? What, what are we allowed to do? What we're not allowed to do? What kind of, what kind of a form of religion are we supposed to exercise? Uh, what is proper? What is not proper? Many, many, many do's and don'ts. And it was totally distracting them to look from looking for Christ in their lives, from looking for Christ in the scriptures, from, from living out of Christ in their lives. It just happened. And Paul says, don't let that happen. It's very interesting that Paul emphasizes that. In Colossians 2.23, he says that all these things, all those concerns about the do's and the don'ts, they have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and sincerity and severity to the body. Sorry about that. But they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. So, <laughs> very, very, very clear statement. Yeah, self-made religion. That certainly is a problem that all Christians today uh, also still uh, battle with. <laughs> and the fourth point that Paul makes, <coughs> he then finally describes in uh, as of starting of chapter three the thing that needs to actually uh, step up and step back into the middle of things and in a lasting manner and that obviously is christ so anything the colossians are supposed to do in speaking in word and deed is about christ is rooted in christ coming from christ yielded to christ targeted and directed to christ always of course christ in a spiritual on a spiritual basis having christ 
um, at the center of your faith. So and there are different points I had mentioned in the in the sermon in German. One point, and, and he lists them then, starting in, in Colossians 3. Colossians 3. First of all, yielding themselves to Christ um, in, in their hearts. Colossians 3, Colossians 3, verses 5 through 8. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked, when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, an obscene talk from your mouth. So on the inside, you have to emphasize Christ and yield things to him. The next point he makes is starting in verse 9, Colossians 3, chapter, 9, uh, chapter 3, verse 9, in what they do in their relationships with fellow Christians and believers. Do not lie to one another, he says, seeing that you have put off the old self with his practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed. And look, how is it renewed? In knowledge after the image of its creator. <laughs> Understanding and knowledge are the driving factor for being renewed. It's very clear. <laughs> And it, it continues in verse 13, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And verse 16, Colossians 3, verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. That is... So that's a, that's that point. First, yield yourself on the inside to Christ. Then, take care of the relationship to your uh, fellow uh, believers. Then comes the next point. That's family, Colossians three verse uh, seventeen. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Not just in the name of God, in the name of Jesus, <laughs> giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Wives, and now he details that wives. How are the wives supposed to do this? What is stated in verse 17? What, how are the wives going to do this? Wives, submit to your husbands, yourself to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. In the Lord. Not just, just do it, but in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything. And not just because I said so, but is pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children. Oh, how I could... Yeah, I'm not, I'm not good at that. I have to really heed that exhortation. Do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. So, and, and there's another block. And now the, the circle of, of influence becomes even broader. First, it's yielding yourself. Then it's relationships to the believers, the God's family. Then it is the personal family. Then it is the behavior against all those outside the world. Colossians 3, verses 22 through 24. Bond servants obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart. And why that? Fearing the Lord. That's the actual ultimate reason. Again, it's Christ. Whatever you do, work heartily, and not just because it's a command, but as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. <laughs> Paul does everything he can to make them understand the beginning and the end of everything is always Jesus Christ. And it, it continues. Well, it's, it, is, it is the basic structure of this letter. Uh, to really boil it down uh, to a couple of short sentences, Paul builds up the glory of Jesus Christ, of his person, who he is, and he intensifies this buildup massively, and he builds it up and builds up, and that uh, actually that actually takes quite some space, quite a part in the epistle, in the letter. And from this aligning, from, from giving the readers this outlook, Christ is the middle of everything. This glory, this importance, this is your rock, this is your root, this is your life. From this, 
from this directing them in that direction, from making them remember all of these, making them remember their understanding that they had way in the beginning, their good start they had. From all of this, then, the, the letter switches to the exhortations and to the uh, admonishing and also to the encouragements. All those things come then. Yeah, <laughs> now comes the real important, a uh, real interesting part of um, this recording and of the sermon I gave in German back then. Well, when we read the epistle to the Colossians, the letter to the Colossians, we see something really very uh, aptly, very clearly. These believers had not quite yet understood the true importance of Jesus Christ. They had not realized, not recognized, not acknowledged how important Christ really is, how central he really is. Maybe they were just so used to the lingo of Christians. Everyone says Christ, everyone says Jesus, everyone says salvation, everyone says church, everyone says uh, ach, I decided to be a Christian, now I'm all saved, and, and all those, those standard things that we know so well in today's church. But it was all so common. Everyone knew, yeah, Christ, I know that, the gospel, I've heard that, I've seen this. But now what? How do we now do our religion, since we know, we know Christ, I've heard the gospel, I got it. <laughs> yeah. But it was not really at the center of their faith. It was something they heard in the beginning. And then they kind of boxed it up. They put it somewhere. And then they got busy with other things in their faith, if you will. Theologian Andreas Kustenberger uh, writes something very, very interesting about uh, the letter to the Colossians. He says, the purpose of Colossians is to combat false teaching with the supremacy of and sufficiency of Christ to combat false teaching with the sufficiency and supremacy of Christ. Is that a good summary of the epistle of the letter? Uh, <clears throat> I, I would say, oh yes, it is. It absolutely is. I mean, I, I took the liberty of just looking of how many times <laughs> in a short epistle like Colossians, how many times Christ is even mentioned. And I only counted Christ, not Jesus, just Christ. He's mentioned Colossians 1, verse 1. Colossians 1, verse 3, verse 4, Christ. 7, verse 24, verse 27, verse 28. And that's it for Colossians chapter 1. Because the chapter is done <laughs> at that verse. Then Colossians chapter 2. Christ in verse 2, 5, 6. 8, 11, 17, 20, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, 3, 4, 11, 15, 16, 24, and also in chapter 4. And to make it even more clear, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna try and, and paint this picture in even more clear and more glorious colors here, I suppose. When this letter talks about faith, it is the faith in Christ. When it talks about serving, it talks about serving, uh, serving Christ. When he talks about afflictions and suffering, it is the sufferings of Christ. If the readers are supposed to, uh, to seek what's above and not what's here on earth. Why is that? Because Christ is sitting to the right hand of God. That's what they're supposed to look at. Is it about the daily life? About how do we try to live in this life? We're supposed to be aligned with Christ, looking at Christ and not at what the world does and wants and, and is about. If where circumcision is mentioned in this in this letter, it's the circumcision of Christ. Where understanding and wisdom is God, wisdom of God is mentioned in this in this letter. Where is it located? Where is where are all treasures of understanding and wisdom located? Where are they hidden? In Christ. All. He says all. They're all in Christ. Is it about Sabbaths? They are a shadow of, of, of what, of what, whom is the substance? The Christ. Is it about the resurrection of the dead, in which, in which the readers 
are supposed to live in this hope? In, in whom did it happen? In Christ, whose word is supposed to dwell richly in them? The word of, not just of God, of Christ. What secret did God reveal about the scriptures? The secret of Christ. <laughs> whose peace is supposed to dwell in them? The peace of Christ. It's just, it is absolutely clear. Andreas Kirstenberger also uh, writes, uh, Paul's letter to the Colossians is possibly or maybe the most Christocentric letter and epistle in the New Testament. Um, <clears throat> to be honest, if you take a really close look at just any other book in the New Testament, it is probably just the same there, only that in Colossians, the word Christ and the, the grammatical focus may be a little bit stronger and more apparent. So now, a very serious question to those who listen to this. Is it, is it <laughs> a realistic way of thinking that if there's something spiritually wrong in a person, that just by focusing on Jesus Christ, you can fix that. Isn't it also so much about self-discipline? <laughs> is it? Is Christ enough? I mean, everything that Paul tells the people to do, he roots everything in Christ. Look at Christ. Think of Christ. Stretch <laughs> your minds in Christ. Have the peace of Christ. Those are all things you don't really do. These are all things that kind of have a lot to do with your, with your mindset having Christ all over it. I think this is a totally doable concept. I think this is totally doable. I fear, I fear that even, well, was it not really even, but especially in today's time, we live in a situation where, where, where we really have to really defend Christ as the center of all things, even in a church, even in, <clears throat> even in churches with Bible-based theology in Christian circles. Himself, we need to really defend. This is how far it is, I feel. This is my experience. You may be a little bit surprised that some theologians have criticized the epistle um, of the Colossians, the letter to the Colossians. This letter has been criticized in that respect that people said, it's impossible that Paul could have written this letter. You know why? Because the critics said Paul would never write a letter that exhorts and glorifies Christ that much. Too much Christ in this letter. The Christology is way too good. It's way too high, way too strong for someone like Paul. I don't even know what to say to a statement like that. If someone is even capable of saying something like that, what, 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 what witness is that about that person's attitude about Jesus Christ? Instead of just seeing that this is what Paul really thinks, that this is this is the background, this is his mindset, this is what 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 sheds a big light and a light, bright light also on the other epistles. Instead of doing that conclusion. People say, oh, no, couldn't have been Paul. Too much, too much Jesus. Uh, I'm afraid I cannot, I cannot <clears throat> agree with that kind of criticism. The next problem is that if someone says, oh, the Christology is too high, Paul cannot have written this thing, it's really opening a door towards saying, you know, Christ is really not that important in the Bible. <laughs> And believe it or not, I have had meetings and conversations with seasoned church ministers and leaders who really have the same position. Christ is not that important in the Bible. He's very important. Yeah, everyone agrees to that. <laughs> everyone wants his salvation. But to agree that he is everything in the Bible, the whole thing was even made unto him. No one would... Very few would agree to that. Well, the text, even in Colossians, says it. So, one minister actually told me 
and that is a few, oh, it's been a few months now, quite a few months, one minister told me, and I'm, I'm quoting literally, I'm going to translate the quote, the quote was in German, and he said, I do not believe that Jesus is really everything. And I, for this situation and statement, I have witnesses. <laughs> And that's a Bible-believing church. It's an evangelical church. But that is, when I heard that, I, I think something in me died on the inside when I heard that. That God's word is about the unfolding of the gospel, about the revelation of Jesus Christ, of his work, that the whole Bible is about this fundamentally. That is really not the basis of the proclamation of God's word anymore at all. Theological systems are really determining what the Bible is supposed to mean or not. Uh, yeah, covenantalism, dispensationalism, all those things that really go, you know, fall off the horse one or the other way. Well, a self-responsible reading of the word of God has been replaced by positions especially new Christians, they're just taught, and then you just simply choose which position you take and what position you want to be convinced of. But you really make your own, uh, paint your own picture from the Bible. Let the Bible speak for itself. Let it interpret itself. Let it reveal to you what it's supposed to say and wants to say, what God wants to say. Only few, I fear, very few do that. And I've been there myself, and I'm grateful to God that he has helped me to, that he has kind of dug me out of that hole a little bit, at least in the last few years. Let's be honest, how many Christians, churchgoers, believers, really just live a catalog on, of, of do's and don'ts, just not based on the Old Testament law, as many call it, but on the New Testament version of the Old Testament law. <laughs> But how many Christians live their life out of Jesus Christ, make their decisions based on him, are prayerful, are prayerful in their, in their everyday life, have him on their minds, are in awe about him when they read the Bible? How many people have that on a sustained, on a sustained basis? Yeah. How many of us really yearn intentionally for Christ in the Bible, are hungry for it, try to understand him, to fathom his glory more and more. All these things, they're mentioned by Paul in Colossians. How many Christians create their own religion within the Christianity and that pushes Jesus essentially out of their lives? Oh, Jesus we know. I've heard of him. I've understood that, but now what do we do? <laughs> that attitude is, is horrible. If you read a tract about the gospel <laughs> and go to a couple of Bible studies and, you know, the gospel is explained to you a few times, you're not done with Jesus, not understanding him, not with understanding what, what he's about, who you really are yourself before him. It will take you a lifetime to find these things, find out about these things in more detail. There's so much to discover. And it is part of how you are redeemed. It is a process. Understanding is what counts. Only then come the works. Colossians 1.16, I would like to read that. Remember this. Paul says, For by him, by Jesus Christ, all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Jesus Christ and for Jesus Christ. These are heavy, weighty statements. Very weighty statements. I will also read Colossians 3, verses 9 and 10 again. Here it says, Again, in the context, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. In verse 10, have put on the new self, which is being renewed. Now, very important. Listen very carefully. This new person, 
this new self is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. It is renewed in knowledge, in understanding. This is a process. That's not done with reading a few tracks and then at some point thinking, oh, I now have decided to be a Christian. Now let's think about what Christian living looks like, about the do's and the don'ts. If this consumes you, you will not, I fear, I fear you will not grow because you will not grow in understanding. You will grow in maybe self-discipline. You will maybe grow in something that a lot of people call character. And, and a lot of people emphasize so much. And But Paul doesn't write that here. He says, this is a process of growing in knowledge, being renewed in knowledge, not renewed in, in, in getting better at doing things better. <sighs> And this is where God, not God, Paul, for obviously God, wants to get those readers. Remember what he writes in Colossians 1, verse 28. That is such an important statement. Paul is after this. He wants to make Christians through the power of God. And those Christians, those believers are supposed to grow in understanding through wisdom. Colossians 1, 28. Him we proclaim. Paul always emphasizes, him I proclaim. I don't preach myself. I preach Christ. This is his mechanism, his lever. Warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. And this maturity is about understanding things, not becoming more and more a perfect uh, New Testament law keeper. Uh, the lever is that. For, uh, Corinth, um, Colossians 1, verses 9 and 10. I still read that. Again, it's, it's something I've read before, but read this again, now that you know what this letter is really about. Colossians 1, verse 9. And so from the day we, Paul means that in, in Timothy, we, from the day we heard about your faith, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with what? Self-discipline? Uh, good deeds? This is really not at all what he is hoping for them for. Pray, he prays for them that they may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom. That is something that has to do with growing mentally, spiritually. Wisdom and understanding. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. The end point is the knowledge of God. Please don't misunderstand me. We have calls to do good works. And we have calls to step into the works that God has prepared for us to do. But the context in which we grow is always rooted in Christ, understanding him more and more. Let us just make sure that we never forget that there's always more to learn about the gospel, about Christ, because God's word was also made unto him. Lord Jesus, I thank you again that uh, you've... Uh, You've kept me through this recording. I thank you that you have uh, also put uh, quite a passion inside of me about your word and that that I don't quite understand why you would uh, just even pick someone, someone so normal, such an ordinary person, just an ordinary sinner to, you know, to have this kind of ministry and to give that, but... Uh, I just trusted you. You're using it to your glory. I do ask you that the things that were misplaced, that were maybe even aptly wrong that I said, that you would, uh, first of all, forgive me as I want to really glorify you and not, not damage your cause, not damage your glory, your, your message of salvation, message of holiness, your good news. And, uh, Second of all, I ask you that you would take away in the in the hearers of this, in the listeners of this recording, and take away all the things that were not correct. That you would help them to understand if there's if there are things to you want them to understand, that you would help them through this recording and that they would maybe just 
visit the uh, epistle to the Colossians and just read it with uh, newly eyes, newly opened eyes, seeing you all over the place, because this is what Paul saw, and this is what you gave him, what you made him see. Help me help us that we would never cease to look for you. Jesus, I really want you, we do want you, and Help us to understand that this is not a game, but it really is very serious, and we do want to love you as good as we can. Please help us. Reveal yourself. Continue to do that, please. In the name of Jesus, I ask you. Amen.